Hello and welcome back once again to the Single Malt Review. Still holding down the fort here by myself. You could almost call this one a bit of a part two to last episode where I reviewed the Glenfiddich 12 years old and had a wee bit of a talk about Glenfiddich itself. Oh, the cat's throwing up. Outstanding. Right, welcome back after that interlude by the cat. Where was I? Yes, Glen Fiddick. Last episode, Glen Fiddick 12. We had a wee look at that one. This time, I'm going to check out Glen Fiddick 18. The first little wee drabby we've got left in here before it goes away. And I think the comparison is going to be quite interesting because for as widespread as the Glen Fiddick 12 is, not much not nearly as much as known about the other releases, of which there are actually quite numerous. They're just far, far less common for, um, well, one primary reason, but a few others, which is a bit of a shame, really, because I think the other Glenfiddichs are actually pretty damned interesting. And this one, this one most of all. So much like the 12-year-old, they're sticking to their old school guns with the presentation here. Coloured, chill filtered, 40%. <sighs> Never mind. Never mind. Um, in this case, I don't actually think it does it too much harm. But as always, I would just be fascinated, so fascinated to see what an unchill filtered version looked like. Not an OH statement, you know, here's some young whiskey we found in the corner and here you go. Um, I'd like to try a real, real 18-year-old unchill filtered version, but anyway, I think actually I'm not going to get my wish in this case because Glenfiddich does what Glenfiddich likes, and it can, because it's a truly, truly huge and successful company, so far be it from me. Far be it from me. It's not that I don't have um, other, other options these days. So, the 18-year-old, how is it different from the 12, and why is it so interesting? Um... To explain this, I'll go back in time, uh, more than 10 years now, really before I drank Scotch whiskey, when I was really only a few years legally able to drink Scotch whiskey, and it's 18 in our territory. Um, I'd had plenty of, well, I'd, I'd had more 12 than anything else, and like a great many people, that was my getting on point for single malt whiskey. I'd had a few blends, you know, some Johnny Walker Red, some other stuff like that, um, and I, yeah, you know, I wasn't, wasn't really sold, I was floating around between that and beer and bourbon and whatever else, um, I, I certainly didn't have a, a drink of choice like I do today, but I did, I did enjoy some Glenfiddich 12 year old, um, funny enough, I used to mix it with Drambuie, make the old rusty nail as it's called, the Scottish, Scottish gateway cocktail, I suppose you could call it, it worked for me, evidently. My rusty nails kept getting more and more, uh, well, more and more whiskey, less and less Drambuie, until uh, one day the training wheels came off, and I didn't need the Drambuie anymore. Lovely story, really. Anyway, um, what I would mix in there would be Glenfiddich 12-year-old, which in hindsight probably a bit of a waste, really, but that was certainly my introduction to the single malt world, and so it was... That for that reason, why you know, I knew about Glenfiddich, the the brand engine had obviously worked because when I saw a bottle of the eighteen year old on special, I thought, well, I'll I'll pick that up and take this to this you know twenty first birthday party or wherever I'm going, and so I did, and drinking that one, um, more drinking it again after the party than on the night itself, I suspect, um, I was for the first time, really, really taken. I was fascinated. I was pulled in. And I really thought about and enjoyed a single malt whiskey on a level that I'd never done before. I wasn't just drinking it because it was nice. I was drinking it and thinking about what I was tasting and picking things out. And I was intrigued and interested in a way that I'd never been before. And that was, in many ways, the start of my whiskey drinking life, I suppose. You could really attribute it to that prescriptive a thing as some people may may deem it as. That's really what got me on board. I mean, it could have been a great many things. That's just what happened to come along at the time. Um, this 18-year-old, 
I think has changed markedly from the one back then. I think the um, maybe it's uh, hindsight, but I remember that first 18 year old tasting way more amazing than this one does. But potentially that was just because that was that was the most complex whisker I'd ever ever tried back then. But that's not to say the 18 of present day is any particular slouch. And this is why. Glenfiddich 12 is a good whiskey, but it's a fairly prescriptive whiskey. Though it says it's aged in bourbon and sherry, I think the sherry aged component is very, very slight. You would call it a pretty typically bourbon matured whiskey for the most part. Older than 12 years old, particularly with the 18, that's where that changes. That's where the Glenfiddich people decide to crack open these sherry casks, these more expensive, rarer sherry casks, and tip some of that into the blend. And that's where things get way more exciting, because that's when Glenfiddich, I think, turns into a really much, much more interesting whiskey. Obviously, it's well, it's made to look darker, but it would naturally look darker as well because of that increased sherry, and you can smell the difference immediately. Almost night and day from the 12-year-old, when the 12-year-old is a very, very typically light space-side fruits, honey, vanilla, yada yada, stuff like that, certainly not without its richness, this one is completely different. It's almost unrecognisable. If I wasn't familiar with it, and you'd given me this and a 12-year-old, I'd say, well, that's 12-year-old Glenfiddich. This one, I would have no clue. I would have probably called it, oof, I don't know, probably a Highland whiskey, actually, given the flavours that it presents. So what flavours are they? Like I said, very, very different from the 12. The fruits here, and there are quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of fruity goodness in here, but it's very, very different. It's extremely ripe red fruits it's red apples the pears are completely gone and so are the greener apples from the 12 these are ripe almost overripe red apples heaps and heaps of dried fruit there's nuts there's a few raisins almonds lots and lots of spices there's nutmeg there's a little bit of a little bit of cinnamon a little bit of clove there's suddenly heaps and heaps of things going on. It's gone from one of the simplest whiskies out there to something really, really quite complex. And it's done it really not just with those few additional years. It's done it because the blend is wildly, wildly different. This is, if anything, sherry dominant. I think it probably isn't, but it tastes like it is. It's very, very different. And it's really very, very good. Albeit for very different reasons. So I've given you the nose. Mm. And the palate. The palate is really quite different. It's a very, very fresh palate. It's very mouth-watering. It's got quite a lot of juicy acidity in there, even more than the 12-year-old, which is interesting. Not that the 12-year-old lacked it, but this one has it in spades. This one really gets the old saliva going with the ripe, sharp, almost tangy quality to that fruit. It's really quite dynamic. Mm. There's chocolate. There's more nuts. <sighs> Still almonds, maybe a few hazelnuts in there as well. Yes, roasted hazelnuts as well, roasted almonds too. Still very sweet, still very malty. But this one, if anything, and it's not a bad thing, less smooth than the 12. There are more jagged edges on this one than in the 12 year old version and I think that's because of the increase in sherried oak which um, the, those butts age slower than the 12 year old so even or rather 12 year old they age slower than the bourbon barrels with which the 12 year old is manifestly comprised of so the whiskey in there actually probably retains more youthful characters um, even with those few years on 
but rather than detract from the whiskey, that I think makes it a bit more exciting. It's a whiskey that you can actually think about. You can actually dissect this one. I could sit here and pull tasting notes out for ages, which I won't do because no one likes long videos on YouTube. Um, but the point I'm trying to get at here is that it is a very, very, very different whiskey than the 12 year old and I think it's pitched at very very different people this is a whiskey for me this is a whiskey that you can engage brain with and really really get to know which the 12 year old is not and so I think um, I would say they're serving you know serving all markets by doing that but the problem is the problem I have of someone of you know fairly uh, moderate I suppose you'd say fairly average means depending on your socio-economic zone. I just can't afford old Glenfiddich. Um, not in any great quantity. As affordable as the 12-year-old is, and it is, it's a very, very affordable 12-year-old whiskey as they go. You find it on special as well, all over the place, just because there's so much of it. Um, anything beyond that, it gets logarithmically expensive, and I don't really quite know why. I mean, presumably they just sell all of their stock as 12 year old, and so they just don't have enough um, older stuff, or they just know that sooner or later very, very wealthy people will pay. Who knows? But the climb from 12 year old to 18, and then God forbid you want even older whiskey than that, is huge. It's really, really devastatingly huge. The 18 year old is on a good day, twice the price of the 12. And if you want to hit the 21 or even beyond that, you're looking at, like I say, the, just asymptotically huge. The curve is steep and it is savage if you want to buy this whiskey. I'm not saying that that's the wrong choice for them. Someone obviously, there's clearly a market for this. There's a, there's a market the world over for people whose money just is not a not even a factor you know who cares blue label whatever um, and maybe that gets them by buoyed by the you know the ubiquity of the 12 year old um, in fact I'm sure it does I just think it's a bit of a shame um, that old Glenfiddich is both so good but also so very very difficult to get a hold of Although that said, I would recommend anyone that hasn't tried the 18 to track it down because the 18 is still it's still on the affordable end of affordable, I suppose. It hasn't quite crossed the line into silly, you know, it's not bloody it's not dull more prices, it's not um no, I won't go and say anything more libelous than that. Um Dalmore's fine. It's it's a bit expensive though. Um yeah, I, I would recommend tracking down the 18, because I think the 18 gives more than a glimpse of the... Good grief. The cats are on some sort of drugs today. I don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, where was I? Yes, try the 18, um, because it's... I'm not going to say revelation, but it's a it's more than a glimpse into just what old Glenfiddich does, and just what more diverse Glenfiddich does, what, what sherry mature Glenfiddich tastes like, and it's it's more than fascinating, I think. It's really, really well worth a look. Even if it's just a ordering a dram across the bar, it's really well worth seeing. Um, that, that's my recommendation there. Anyway, I, again, it just makes me, I just wish I could try a 46% uncolored, unfiltered version. It would just tell me so much about the whiskey, and a whiskey geek like me, I would just find that just endlessly, endlessly fascinating. But never mind, never mind. There are, as I say, plenty of options if you want that. So scores for this one. It's a little bit tricky because trying to remain objective when I score things, although not completely objective, that's not really our thing over here at the Single Malt Review. It's what we enjoy and what we what we don't. Um, I try to take um, take stock of tastes beyond my own and how they apply. This one is very good, but for very different reasons than the 12 year old, which I scored in 89. This is better, but though it's, I find it much, much better to my taste, I will moderate, moderate my, um, my uh, 
sort of scoring hyperbole that I might generate from that because I don't think it's... I think if you gave it to someone who wasn't me, who wasn't such a whiskey geek, they would say, well, you know, they're, they're different. They're not better than one another. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. So this one gets a 92 from me. I mean, it's a very strong score and it's a very good whiskey. Um, attainable or otherwise. So that that one, I think, it's um, probably one of my more restrained scores for something I really, really do enjoy. Um, but no, I, I do have to I do have to think of the wider the wider market. I think we we like to think we're getting more uh, scientific, more objective here at the Single Malt Review as we score more whiskies, um, which probably says terrible things about our earlier scores. But never mind, never mind. Um, at any rate, at any rate. That'll do it from me, I think. I hope you found that um, useful, interesting, or something in between those two. I will hopefully be back with Dave next time when he's back in country. And um, we'll have something maybe less um, mass market for you then. We'll get back to the weird stuff. I know how you like the weird stuff. Anyway, Slanger, be right back. <laughs>